Welcome back to the lectures on computer graphics. We are in the very last phase of the lecture series. Uh, so far, we have discussed various aspects of computer graphics, starting from devices to transformations to uh, clipping, line drawing, rendering, hidden surface removal, and in the last class, we have seen a few special uh, uh, miscellaneous topics dealing with aliasing, animation, soft object modeling and so on and so forth. Well, no computer graphics application or tool is uh, complete without uh, handling pictures or digital images. Okay? So, digital images or digital image processing, although is a subject by itself, forms in most graphical applications or tools uh, an important part of uh, uh, the application. So, one of the applications of computer graphics is also digital image processing, where you should know how digital image pictures are stored, retrieved, how they are manipulated if necessary. And uh, as I was saying, there you have to go through a very exhaustive full fledged course on digital image processing, but from the point of view of computer graphics, I will give uh, uh, brief highlights of a, a few effects, uh, a few aspects of uh, digital image processing, which is necessary from the computer graphics angle. You will need to uh, store pictures in certain formats, you need to uh, uh, retrieve them as well, you need to retrieve them as well. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you also need to manipulate them, you need to alter certain pictures. Of course, you know to probably rotate pictures in 2D, but we will talk about scenarios where the image is of degraded quality and you will see how. Uh, uh, in the in the time to come, how to enhance the pictures, how to remove noise from the pictures. The image could be noisy due to various uh, uh, effects uh, uh, due to uh, sampling itself or due to the electronic circuitries which create noise in the picture. Uh, there could be noise coming out when the image is transmitted over the net. So, we will see tos topics about image enhancement also. Okay? But first come first sir, we will see how the digital image uh, is stored in a computer. Of course, there are various ways by which uh, uh, or formats, various file formats uh, based on which a digital image is stored and we will only discuss, we will be probably able to discuss only one of them in some details and I will probably name a few other formats which uh, do exist. Of course, there are numerous uh, proprietary digital image formats. Uh, based on which the picture or a digital image is stored in a computer. But we will talk about a compression standard, which is very commonly used in uh, different websites, web pages, uh, the uh, uh, sites which host digital image galleries. It will typically store image in a certain format, which is easy to transmit without much of loss of information without much of degradation and quality, you need to store a picture in a as small amount of disk space as possible, not only to save storage space, but also you should need less time to transmit over the internet. These days we have website which not only hosts different type of graphical uh, pages and, uh, uh, and contents, but also pictures and movies of course, but if you take just pictures by itself. Uh, there, are, there are a whole lot of image galleries and other websites which uh, store uh, pictures, okay, which you can retrieve. But uh, when you need to retrieve the picture, uh, the, the content of the uh, graphics page takes a long time when you need to download a digital picture. If it is very large in size, the amount of time required to transmit it over the net could be very large. So, you need to compress it and store it. So, we will talk about the digital image compression format called the JPEG and these are the two aspects which we will discuss today about digital image processing. One is about compression and the second part will be on image enhancement, which we, where we talked about 
trying to remove the noise in the picture and improve the quality of a picture. So, before going into JPEG, let us also look at the different digital image file formats. I was just mentioning a little while earlier that there are various types of file formats uh, um, which are used to store digital pictures. Okay? So, just to name a few of the most commonly used or popular file image file formats which are used by most graphical systems or image even image processing toolkits or webs, web pages or websites which host pictures are the following. Let us see a few of them. Here we see a list of a few commonly used and popular digital image file formats. Uh, well, the first of this is the JPEG format which we will discuss in detail today. Uh, it is developed by the Joint Photographic Experts Group, the society of that developed uh, this digital image file format which will be based on discrete cosine transform. We will discuss this in detail later on. Then of course, the same group came up with a JPEG 2000 uh, which is based on discrete wavelet transform. Uh, among the other popular file formats are the BMP which is uh, known as the bitmap file format. Uh, then we have the uh, TIFF, T -I -F -F, TIFF which is uh, when you expand the uh, you will uh, see that it is tagged image file format. So, that is a very common format used for scanning documents, the TIFF or the tagged image file format. Then you have a class of uh, uh, digital file formats called the PGM, P PBM and PPM together. Uh, uh, almost uh, quite a few things are common in terms of the file headers here. The PGM is called the portable gray map. PGM is portable gray map, PBM is portable bitmap, I repeat port portable bitmap is PBM and PPM is portable pixel map. So, these uh, fall under one class of portable map file formats gray, uh, bit and the pixel respectively. Uh, then at the bottom left of your screen you have the GIF which is the graphic interchange format, I repeat graphic interchange format. You also have the uh, RAS which is the sun raster file format typically used uh, for storing pictures in uh, sun OS systems. It is called the sun raster image file format. Then you have the raw uh, file format which is uh, could be used in any system. In fact, it is uh, uh, a, a file of the digital image which does not contain any overhead in terms of the pixel resolution, the number of uh, um, bytes per pixel and the format etcetera. So, raw will not contain any information about the format of the file, it is a format free. Uh, typically, you may have 1 byte per pixel for monochrome or 3 bytes per pixel for color. Uh, then of course, you again have the SGI, uh, the SGI uh, um, format for storing uh, uh, graphic images in SGI, which it is in SGI silicon graphics. Uh, proprietary format like we had the RAS which was a sun raster proprietary format, SGI is the uh, SGI proprietary format. Uh, then you have here XBM, well XBM is a monochrome bitmap format, monochrome bitmap format in which the data is stored in a C language data array. So, it is almost similar like a raw uh, where the data is stored as a C language data array monochrome bitmap. Uh, the CDR is again a proprietary format of Corel draw. In, in when you use the Corel Draw software for drawing images and pictures, you basically uh, uh, save it in Corel Draw format, uh, basically vectored format for storing uh, pictures, drawings, whatever you have. And then the last of this, which you see on the right bottom of your screen, is the PNG format or the Portable Network Graphics format. PNG is Portable Network graphics format. So, these are uh, a few examples of the commonly used popular digital file formats. So, let us go back and look at JPEG compression which we will discuss. We will discuss about the JPEG file format which is used because that is probably one of the most commonly used and why it is probably most commonly used is uh, that it can store pictures in a compressed format. and uh, and when you have a huge database of image galleries to store and this space becomes a criteria for you to store a large database of uh, image galleries, let us say, then uh, a compression standard 
uh, using a com mechanism to compress the image data and store it will be very useful and handy, because you will require less space to store each image file. And you can store more images or more image files within a certain disk space, limited amount of disk space, although whatever large it may be, uh, if the each individual image files take some or require some small amount of disk space than the uh, raw image format, where the uh, each uh, um, uh, pixel requires one or three bytes to store. Okay. So, let us look into the image compression standard called the JPEG. We will see the expansion of the word JPEG very soon. So, we will discuss today the image compression standard JPEG or JPEG as it is uh, popularly known as. Okay. Before going into uh, JPEG format, we will understand what is image compression. The basic requirement of image compression is to reduce the amount of data required to represent a digital image. So, we talked about this that the amount of storage space in your secondary storage or even primary secondary storage mostly to store the image formats. If that can be minimized somehow then you can accommodate more number of image files within a certain uh, limited disk space. So, the basic purpose of image compression is to reduce the amount of data required to represent a digital image. How to reduce? Well, we will see soon that an image has lot of redundant data. So, we will try to remove the redundancy in the data or remove the redundant data uh, and store it in a compressed format. And the question comes, where is the redundancy and why at all do we have redundancy in the image format? Well, that is a, a big question, but we will answer that with a few points in the next slide that where is this redundancy? That is the extra data, which you do not need to probably store to display the image properly uh, in, in some form without much of degradation in quality. If there is a redundancy, uh, that means, some extra amount of bits or bytes are used to represent each individual pixels or a group of pixels, let us say, can we throw off a few bytes, can we throw off a few bits per pixel or for a group of pixels and that means, the entire image for that matter and then use less amount of storage space to store the data. So, where is the redundancy? Well, the first type of redundancy is which exist is the coding redundancy. Well, this concept is uh, typically similar to data compression. Okay. Those who have background and data compression can easily follow that. Otherwise, uh, I believe that uh, you have to read up concepts of at least the say the Hoffman tree or the Hoffman coding format to understand what is data compression. A very typical question which could be asked to you um, or by any image processing expert is that what is the difference between a data compression and an image compression. Okay. Further, of course, there is another question between data processing and image processing, but this that is not a uh, question which should be attended in this lecture, but at least since we are di discussing compression as a part of computer graphics here, uh, we will uh, see that whatever concepts of data compression are applicable for any data. When you talk of any data, I am talking of bytes of records of uh, student roll numbers, CGPAs, addresses. Okay, data in the form of text files, okay, data in the form of executable files, various other types of files, object files, uh, Adobe PDF files, uh, you need a set, set certain number of bytes to store any type of file. And there is redundancy in any sort of that data and you can use a, a zip tool, any sort of a zip tool to compress the data and that is done based on the concept of data compression or data redundancy. So, similar concept is also of course, definitely applicable in the case of a digital image, where you have a coding, coding redundancy, coding redundancy as you can see here, where we will say that the gray levels of the image uses more code symbols than what is really needed or what is actually needed to represent it. That means, the pixels of an image sometimes use more number of bits than what is actually necessary. Well, if you say each pixel, if you remember the display devices and the video RAM, which we discussed the refresh buffer, we were talking of 3 bits, 8 bits or even 24 bits to represent a pixel. 
8 bits for a gray level, 16 uh, bits also possible or uh, 24 bits for a full color. The question is do you need all those bits to represent a full image? Well, the question is not because if you take individual bytes out of those pixels, it will be a combination of zeros and ones. There will be few zeros and few ones depending upon the gray level value or the color value. And you can probably throw off a few of those very efficiently of course, cannot throw them in a very random manner okay, and, and use the non redundant bits or bytes to store that information. And that is done precisely the same way as is done in any, any coding concept. Okay. You should be able to uh, get this concept of Hoffman coding based on uh, any uh, data compression course or even under algorithms course where Hoffman tree construction is explained. Okay. So, I leave that as an exercise that you assume uh, for the time being that you know Hoffman coding or you will go back and study it okay. because that is an integrated part of JPEG compression as well. So, data compression is done by that particular concept of coding redundancy. As we move to the next part, inter pixel redundancy which is an important part of image compression not data compression here because data may not have pixels, but the image do have pixels. So, this inter pixel redundancy results from structural or geometric relationship between objects in an image, results from structural or geometric relationships between objects in an image. That means, if you look at a set of pixels, neighborhood pixels in an image, let us say if you are looking at this picture towards me and you take a set of pixels around this particular corner let us say which could be bright and then you can have grayer shade here. Okay. Let us say if you are looking into a set of pixels through this particular region, okay, or take, you can take a small rectangular strip, the pixels have the same value. All the pixels in the background let us say for the image, let us say you are look at a static picture that will have the same value. And most parts of the image will have such continuous set of uh, uniform gray level values, uniform color of pixel values. Then why do we store all those color information for all those pixels? You do not need it. That means, the concept is that between adjacent pixels in the neighborhood, between adjacent pixels in a neighborhood, if you take a group of pixels around in an image except at certain very few small parts of the image in general the adjacent pixels or nearby pixels have same or if not same very similar color or gray level shade. And this inter pixel uh, difference is so small compared to the actual values that if you store the inter pixel difference which could be 0 or a very small number you will need few number of bits to store that than the actual value. The actual value let us say could be in the range of 100 to 200 in that range let us say, but if you take adjacent pixels the gap could be as low as about 1, 2 or even 10 or 20 or even some cases 0. And if you need to store values in the range of 1 to 10 or 20 let us say the number of bits you know you can do with only 4 or 5 bits. Whereas, to store values in the range of 100 or 200 you will need 7 or 8 bits. So, there comes the inter pixel redundancy where you can throw off those extra bits somehow by storing only the differences and you require less number of bits to store the difference. You will see that using a set of neighborhood with an example later on where adjacent pixels have similar values and then you can throw off uh, the redundant bits and store only the differences and th those differences are what? They are not the redundancies the inter pixel redundancy is in the value which is something like all the values are high. They are similar and high or low whatever the case may be you just store the differences and by storing the differences the redundancy is thrown out. So, results from structural or geometric relationship between objects in an image basically means that nearby pixels belong to the same structure or the same geometrical uh, object and hence they will have the same pixel values and those all those pixels you do not need to store uh, uh, explicitly in an image uh, to display it. That is where the inter pixel redundancy lies. The third redundancy comes from the fact that the psycho visual redundancy, psycho visual redundancy which says that our eyes do not respond to 
all visual information, our eyes do not respond to all visual information. Now, this concept is related to the uh, uh, perception of the eye, visual perception of the eye. Okay. That means, although typically our eye is probably the best visual sensor available in the world, very naturally built by nature. Okay. There could be other types of sensors which could be efficient in a certain environment um, or an application okay, uh, visual sensors, but uh, compared to the normal charge coupled device cameras, our eye in fact can adjust to very large range of variations of intensity or color. That means, with our eye we can see almost in a very dark room to a moderate dark, to a moderately bright, to a very brightly illuminated room or uh, in, a, in, in an outdoor environment where we have bright sunshine. In a bright sunny day to a gloomy day, our eye more or less reacts or works in a similar manner. Why? Because the eye has a set of sensors called the rods and cones in the retina, which can definitely adjust itself to changes in brightness. When you move from a dark room to a uh, to an outdoor bright sunny day um, in, in the outside environment or come from outside to the inside of a room, you will need a little bit of time all right, but your eye do adjust. So, the eyes do adjust to a large scale of range of variations of light in dB units if you say. Okay. Illumination variations it can adjust, but on the other hand it has one more drawback. Small variations in intensities it neglects. perceptual psychologists or biologists or neurologists will be able to tell us that small variations the eye is not very sensitive. That means, you change the illumination little bit in the room by artificial mechanisms switching on switching off one light more than that changing the illumination by controlling the voltage of, of the lamps which are illuminating the room. The eye does not uh, 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 respond to small very small variations. Well, if this variation is significant it does but in otherwise it cannot. In fact, when you are uh, seeing a picture and if there are small variations in gray levels of pixels, the eye integrates, the high sees an integral effect of that and almost throws off those small variations. Sometimes it does is not able to see, even if it sees of course, the brain will also discard it. So, that means, in an image we do not need to show or store small variations in gray levels of pixels. Okay, to display the information content of the image. Okay. That is the psycho visual redundancy, where small variations in gray levels also can be thrown off and we can only maintain large variations in gray level values. Let us say what I mean by this, if you are talking of an 8 bit pixel uh, format to store uh, 8 bytes, no, 8 bits or 1 byte per pixel to store a digital image, that means values from 0 to 255. Well, you can probably visualize changes of values from 50 to 100 to 150 to 200 and so on, but small changes say 150 to 155 or even 160, okay. the, the eye cannot locate such a small difference. So, eyes do not respond to all of the visual information uh, present in the image in terms of small changes in color or gray level and hence those also could be eliminated. So, that is why you have three types of redundancies now and this we will see how it is handled by the digital image compression format called the JPEG, which is one of the standards of compression. Well, there are two types of compression, one is the lossless, another is lossy. Uh, entropy coding, which is uh, uh, an example of entropy coding, which I gave you was the Hoffman coding uh, is lossless for data compression and we can have lossy, which eliminates psycho visual redundancies, so, because if you throw off small variations in gray levels, you cannot recover them back. The difference between lossy and lossless is, if you store an image in a lossless compression format, then you will not be able to recover the entire image under any circumstances. Some information will already be lost, but the image will apparently look very similar to the original image. We will see that with an example that how the image properties overall does not change, small variations you may be able to locate, but not much. But in the case of loss, uh, lossless 
compression loss less compression uh, you will be able to recover the whole image in the case of lossy compression in the case of lossy compression you will not be able to recover the entire image. So, these are the two types of compressions which are available and the three types of uh, lossy compression uh, transform coding, vector quantization, fractal coding and we will see that our concept of JPEG compression deals with transform coding mostly and we also have a little bit of quantization step available. Okay. So, that is the expansion of JPEG, JPEG or JPEG as it is called, it is a joint photographic experts group that is the name which developed the standard for compression of an image and basically it performs transform coding that means it transforms to an image to a frequency domain. Okay. Now, those who have some idea of about signal processing or image processing a little bit will be able to follow what I mean by transforming an image or pixel data to a frequency domain. Those who have not can just go through the equations and then later on go back and look into a book on signal or image processing and look into concepts such as Fourier transform or discrete cosine transform, discrete Fourier transform or discrete cosine transform which is typically used for transform coding in JPEG compression. I will show you the equation and try to describe within the limited time uh, available to me what does it mean, but uh, you have to go back and look into concepts of discrete Fourier transform or discrete cosine transform to have a good idea. Okay, so, let us look at the flow chart of JPEG compression. The flow chart of JPEG compression says that you have an input image here which will be transformed by, by discrete cosine transform. So, that is the transform coding and then it will be quantized. So, we do have a quantization table which will do that for you and then of course, it passes through an entropy coding which I will not have much time to discuss, but I will say that this is basically based on Hoffman coding and then of course, that gives you the compressed image. So, this entropy coding does the lossless uh, data compression and the transform coding does the psycho visual and inter pixel redundancies are thrown off in the transform and the quantized uh, quantization steps and the entropy coding is lossless where it does the typical data compression. So, there are basically broadly about three steps in the JPEG compression, transform, quantize and entropy coding. Let us look at the transform, okay. that is a JPEG encoder where an image is passed through a FDCT, that FDCT means forward discrete cosine transform. I repeat forward discrete cosine transform. So, a source image is split up into 8 cross 8 blocks. Okay. So, it is divided into sub images or windows. Okay. Each sub image or window is of size 8 cross 8. That means, let us say if you have an image 80 cross 80, if you have an image of size say 80 cross 80, then how many blocks will you have? If each block is size 8 by 8, you will have 100 blocks. How? Well, we have 10 rows and 10 columns of blocks. So, an array of blocks each and that array of blocks, blocks will have 10 rows and 10 columns because 80 by 8, so 10. If the image size is 256 cross 256, if the image size is 256 by 256, can you guess what will be the array of blocks, how many rows and columns you will have of the array of blocks? Very simple 256 by 8, so you will have 32 cross 32 array of blocks. So, each of these blocks after the source image is split into 8 cross 8 blocks, each of these blocks separately pass through a forward discrete cosine transform, we will see the equation here, then it passes through the quantizer and of course, entropy encoded and get the compressed image. As I was saying FDCT is a forward discrete cosine transform. Let us look forward, JPEG decoder, we had the encoder which produced you the encoder produced with the compressed image from the source image or input image. That was the job of the encoder, which will give you the compressed image much, much less in size and compact compared to the number of bytes required to store the original source image or input image. Compressed image requires less size. What is the job of the decoder? Just the reverse. Take the compressed image and then produce the reconstruct back the original or input image. So, that is what the decoder does here, it takes a compressed image as you can see here, 
takes the compressed image, there is an entropy decoder as we had an entropy encoder is the reverse task of the Hoffman encoder. We have a Hoffman decoder here, dequantizer instead of a FDCT which you had for an encoder, the decoder will have a inverse discrete cosine transform. IDCT is inverse discrete cosine transform and it is, this is done for each block, it is done for each block separately and the blocks will be stacked up in an array and that is what helps you to provide the reconstructed image. So, the role of the encoder is just the reverse of the decoder or the job of the decoder is the reverse of the encoder step. Okay. So, let us get into the concept of what happens in the transform coding in frequency domain. So, if you look back the JPEG discrete cosine transform based image compression, we know that the image is broken into 8 cross 8 blocks and then pixels are level shifted by 2 to the power n minus 1. So, if there are small n number of bits to store small n number of bits to store the pixel values or represent the pixel value, then the maximum number of uh, the value will be 2 to the power n uh, minus 1 will be the maximum level value or 2 to the power n values will be available. So, half of that 2 to the power n minus 1 is the. So, if n is 8, so it will be divided by 2 to the power uh, uh, 7 that is 2 to the power 8 minus 1, 2 to the power 7 which is 128. So, it will be shifted by 128, 256 by 2. So, pixels are level shifted by 2 to the power n minus 1 and then DCT transform is computed in each block. We will see the equation now and then the DCT coefficients which are obtained by the DCT transform are then quantized and then they are entropy encoded by the half pen tree and that produce, that part is lossless. The lossy part comes here in the trans, terms of the DCT transform and the quantized coefficients. Okay. This is an example of what is discrete cosine transform. Well, those who are familiar with uh, discrete Fourier transform will understand that this expression looks very uh, similar to that f x y is an input uh, two dimensional array or a function t u v are the um, transform coefficients u and v represents the variables for the frequency. Uh, in, in, in analog case the integral is becomes a sigma in a discrete case 0 to n minus 1 the size here n is 8. So, it will run from 0 to 7 both x and y and g x u v is basically the basis. In the Fourier transform it is an exponential uh, imaginary part and in the case of discrete cosine transform the expression of g x y u v is given by this particular expression. Product of two cosines one along u one along v Okay. and alpha u and alpha v are the normalized coefficients as given here. So, that is all you can just note down this expression here and uh, these are just the normalized uh, fact, normalizing factors. Inverse cosine transform will also have a similar expression only you will have a, a negative sign. Okay. Uh, that is what is the risk of cosine transform. So, given an f x y the g x is given as given here, g x u v is given here and given a certain f x y of a certain dimension or size from 0 to n minus 1, you will get the corresponding T u v which are the discrete cosine transform or in short henceforth we will say DCT coefficients that is what is typically used. Generally DCT coefficients discrete cosine transform coefficients T u v. Okay. These are the basis patterns. If you look at uh, 8 different uh, basis, you can see there are horizontal uh, columns of 8 and uh, sorry horizontal rows of 8 basis and, or, and vertical columns of 8 blocks and each represents a certain g x u v. Okay. G x v as given by this expression here, this particular expression with this forget the alpha part which is just the normalizing factor, the cosine it is basically a cosine along vertical and horizontal vertical directions given by x and y and u and v are the frequencies along x and y respectively. So, as you can see here if you move along a horizontal direction you will see increasing frequencies of a cosine. This is like a, a sinusoidal curve represented in terms of shown in terms of frequency, but you can see as you move to the right or from top to down u increasing from left to right v increasing from top to bottom the frequency of the pattern is increasing. So, these are the DCT basis patterns and any 8 cross 8 block of pixels which are obtained from the images can be represented in fact are represented as a sum of these 64 basis patterns. So, you have 64 
pixels for in a block which is represented as a sum of weights of these basis patterns. Fourier transform also does in terms of sinusoidal frequency cosine and sine uh, e to the power g omega this is in terms of the cosine function okay, that is the difference. So, that is what it is done here and then output of the DCT is the set of weights for these basis patterns these are what are called the DCT coefficients they, the, the DCT coefficients are nothing but the are, are the set of weights are the sets set of weights obtained by discrete cosine transform and multiply each basis pattern by its weight and add them together if you do that you will be able to get the original image block from which image block mind you based on which you got the DCT coefficients. Okay. So, you got this DCT coefficients from the image block, but if you use this set of weights or DCT coefficients and multiply the basis pattern with these weights which you got or the DCT coefficients which you got multiply the basis pattern you should get the original image block back. So, that is part of the reconstruction process the inverse DCT which we will see <coughs> that is given DCT coefficients given the basis pattern if you go back to the equations it means basically you are given T u v and the G x u v, G x u v is the uh, functional basis and T u v are the DCT coefficients given those two you can reconstruct f x y back also based on certain orthogonal relationship we will skip over those mathematics <laughs> with the time constraint in mind because this is not a full fledged compression lecture on image compression we are just giving highlights about how to compress the data. So, let us take an example of compression. So, let us look at a sample 8 cross 8 block the image could be any size, but I have just taken an arbitrary 8 cross 8 block from the image and these are the pixel values as you can see here the values range as high as from 154 down to a, uh, a low value of, uh, of about 52. So I, I think I, um, that seems to be the lowest possible value this seems to be the highest possible values. So, you can uh, see yourself that you need 8 bits to store these pixel values. They are first level shifted by 2 to the power n minus 1. So, minus 128 subtract sub, or add minus 128 or subtract 128 from the previous sample which is this sample 8 cross 8 block minus uh, minus 1. So, let us take so 52 minus 128 what will you get minus 76. Let us take another value the maximum value 154 minus 128 what will you get 26. So, this is how the level shifting is done each individual pixel are subtracted with the value. 128 and on this what we do is we take the DCT coefficients after transform we get this set of coefficients as you can see here this is called the DC coefficient that means it is it resembles some sort of an average energy of uh, uh, the 8 cross 8 block and you can see these coefficients are those weights and as you move towards the right or down and more diagonally across you will see that you find lesser and lesser weight values. So, that is that is the interesting step if you look back again uh, I, I mentioned here this is the DC coefficient here and move to the right move to the bottom or move diagonally across the 8 cross 8 you will find that the numerical value of the DCT coefficients keep going down that means most of the information is in here actually if you suppress some of these values you are not losing much of information in the image because the there is where is we will say the redundancy is in the inter pixel or psycho visual part lies in the high frequency contents. They are important in some cases, but if you are not interested in the actual values of the pixels for certain applications for certain image processing applications you will need the exact pixel values in which the, you can may not be able to throw the redundancies, but in terms of simple viewing transmission fast transmission and viewing when you can afford to lose data or have lossy representation or lossy storage you do not require lossless that is what I mean then you can throw off this redundant information not required before the coding starts in terms of the Hoffman coding or entropy coding the interpixel redundancies the psycho visual redundancies information that can be thrown out of the image and that is done by we will see how by if you look at this coefficient this small coefficient values contribute to less to the overall information of the image the DC coefficient and all values nearby around here are what the important information is. The information here is very negative and of course, you can see already some of the coefficients have started to become 0. Okay. So, how do you do this? You use a quantization table which is also suggested by JPEG and you say 
that you divide those div, uh, you basically divide the DC coefficients by the quantization table. Let us go back, this was the DCT coefficients. So, pixel by pixel here, we should not use the word pixel, the coefficients each array say if this is AIJ index, uh, arbitrary index if you take AIJ say 4, 3 or 3, 4, this particular uh, DCT coefficient will be divided by the corresponding value in the quantization table. Okay. So, uh, they take this mask of the quantization table, put it on top of this DCT coefficients and divide and you will get a resultant information like this. The quantized coefficients which you will have, will have these values and it is scanned in what is called, this is an important step in JPEG compression, these are scanned in what is called as a zigzag pattern. You do a zigzag scan, if you start from this and try to move in this fashion as pointed out by this blue arrow here, then you will find you will get a zigzag scan order in which the coefficients automatically will be shorted in more or less descending order. Let us look at the zigzag scan order. You see that the first value will be 20, minus 26, minus 3, 1, minus 3, minus 2, minus 6, then 2, minus 4, 1, minus 4, 1, 1, 5 and so on. So, let us look at the first few values 26, minus 3, 1, minus 3, minus 2, minus 6. So, first value will be minus 26. Look at the zigzag scan output. As I said earlier, minus 26, 3 and 1, minus 26, minus 3, there should be a minus here minus 26, minus 3, 1, minus 3 again, minus 2, minus 6, 2, okay, minus 4, 1, minus 4 and so on. Okay. Uh, so, this should be minus 3 and there should be a minus 3 here. Okay. So, that is the scan order and of course, you do not need to go all the way around up to all the 64 uh, values to 0 because you see all the values are already 0 here. How come all these values are 0? Because the quantization table which uh, had uh, the values to be divided, okay, the values in the DCT coefficients are divided by the quantization table, they are adjusted in such a manner that unless a significant DCT coefficient of a higher frequency is prominently available, that value will automatically become 0. Okay. So, you do not need to store all these 0 values. In fact, you see that the last non-zero value is stored here minus 1 and then you can put end of buffer. So, that means that beyond this all the values here will be 0, EOB all the values here will be 0. Okay. So, you can see that the sequence is already shorted from about 8 cross 864 values, you will probably have about 20, 25 values at the most 30 values let us say. In this case, you can count it yourself and find out how many values you have to store and this zigzag scan output is taken to the entropy encoder this zigzag scan is done, so that the coefficients are in order of increasing frequency, then the highest frequency coefficients are more likely to be 0 after quantization that we have seen that already and then this improves the compression of run length coding. This means, when you have more zeros towards the end and you do not need to even store them, then the run length coding also could be used when uh, if, we, if you need to store all of them, then of course, you can use run length coding otherwise you do not need. Entropy coding, the DC coefficients are difference coded. This means that the difference between the current DC coefficient block and the previously coded sub-image DC coefficient is found out. Well, we said that the image is divided into small 8 cross 8 blocks. So, you do not need to store the first DC coefficient quantized value itself. You can look at the difference between the first DC coefficient or DC coefficient of the first block and the DC coefficient of the second block and the DC coefficient third block and so on. And there also you provide interpixel redundancy. That means, you throw off the actual value and store only the difference. That means, if you have the first value and the difference there on, then you can reconstruct the actual values also. So, the DC coefficients are difference coded. That means, that the again I repeat difference between the current DC coefficient and the previously coded sub image DC coefficient is found out and then Hoffman coded by referring the DC code table. You can use a Hoffman coding uh, can be used here, okay, which is the entropy coding. The non-zero AC coefficients, because there could be some zero AC coefficients, the non-zero AC coefficients are coded using what is called a variable length coding, first they are run length coded and then they are Hoffman coded. So, this is the part of the entropy coding and similarly you can have an entropy decoding. 
in order to with the time limitations available I may not be able to cover great details about this, but you will be able to run uh, learn yourself if you do a course on coding theory data compression itself or based on simple data structures and algorithms where Hoffman tree is covered where the Hoffman coding and decoding also will be covered. So, assuming that you know or you will come to know about the uh, entropy coding you if you have done entropy coded a certain sequence in this case the sequence is DC quantized zigzag sequence I repeat not DC quantized sequence quantized zigzag scan sequence okay, that is entropy coded you can use a decoder to recover the same coefficients in the same zigzag scan pattern and the data coded is entropy decoder in the decoder. So, we we'll look at the reconstruction back and this is what you will get back. This is an example of what you will get back as you can see there are probably more zeros than what we saw. The first value was still minus 26 okay, minus 3 1 and so on, but there are lot more zeros because that has come due to the coding and the, and the decoding part. Okay. Some values have been thrown off already and then they are multiplied by the same quantization table. This is the quantization table which you use to quantize the original DC coefficient. So, you must multiply it back okay, to give the denormalized coefficients. Of course, we must keep in mind that the DC coefficient you might have to take the difference from the previous block to add to this to get the DC coefficient back, but if this is the first block then of course, you have to get the actual one. Otherwise, for each successive blocks you only store the difference and the difference is coded. So, you take the difference and look into the previous DC coefficient and then add it that is what you need to do for successive blocks. So, you get the denormalized coefficients either first block or any block and this is the you can see here that lots of zeros. This was not present earlier. We had some zeros, but not so many in the coefficients DC coefficients derived after from the h cross h block of pixels it went through quantization step, it went through entropy coding that part was of course, lossless and length and of course, there we uh, threw off only the uh, 0 coefficients we were not coding anyway non-zero AC coefficients were encoded and that process of quantization has thrown off certain redundancy information and that is like chopping off high frequency or small variations in the image. Okay. So, this is the denormalized coefficients what will be has to be done now with the denormalized coefficients you need to apply a inverse DCT inverse discrete cosine transform will give you these values from the previous uh, this was the denormalized coefficients apply inverse DCT get this this was already simulated and uh, given to you you do not have to copy these values, but just to note after inverse DCT you need to level shift the values remember you had shifted the values by subtracting 128 2 to the power n minus 1. So, you have to add that value here. So, after inverse DCT if you look back to this table you need to add 128 which will give you after levels shifting the reconstructed sum image. This is what you get back after JPEG compression of the 8 cross 8 block all 8 cross 8 blocks will go through this sequence. Now, you if you remember the values I will show them to you just now in the next slide that the values have changed this is what we get after encoding and decoding that is why I will say it is the reconstructed sub image of 8 cross 8 the original values of the image were something like this these was the original sub image. Let us look at a few values first row 52, 55, 61 what have these values become this become 58, 64, 67. Okay. Let us look at the column 52, 63, 62, 63 has become I am sorry has become 58, 56, 60, 69. The, this is the result of coding and decoding from the starting point which was 63, 62. Let us look at the maximum value 154. What has this value become now after reconstruction? You see it is still the largest one, but it is 149. So, that means at each point there is an error which has script in. Now, strictly it is not an error because that is what we want to do. We wanted to throw some redundant information and store only those information which is essential and that is what it is. Okay. And so, each pixel will have certain variations, but it does not cause much in terms of when you look at the picture. We will see with, with an example with the picture also, but let us look at the difference. Let us look at the difference between the original and reconstructed sub image pixel wise. You see in some cases of course, you do not have a difference, but the difference is 0, but you can have a maximum difference of as large as about 12 or even 14 that is the maximum error. 
which you will have. This pixel has the maximum error. What is this? Let us look at this value. This value was 6 has is was 66, it was actually 80. We got reconstructed value 80, the original value was 66, that is why you got a maximum error of 40. Now, you followed this pixel by pixel, 8 cross 64 values we have subtracted, and this is the error which we have got. Okay? So, let us look at the image, uh, this is done into an overall image. What happens? Does the image look really bad if we have these errors after reconstructing back? Once it is uh, reconstructed back and is stored in this JPEG format, format, you will always reconstruct back the same image which you will be seeing now. Okay? That is what, uh, because once the redundant information is thrown out, there will be not be any further loss, unless you force some more redundant information to be thrown out, because in JPEG 2000 and in JPEG, you can actually uh, uh, select the quality of the picture and highest quality will leave largest space and lesser quality. Uh, will require lesser space. Okay? So, let us look at an example, that is a standard example, which is used in image compression literature by all researchers worldwide, the classical image of the LENA. Of course, it is a colored image, uh, do not worry about the color factor. So, if this is the original image and if you carefully look at it, uh, this was the original image, I will show an example of uh, an image compression using JPEG, where the compression ratio is 4.2 is to 1. That means, I am able to use JPEG compression and compress it to almost one fourth the size, 4 is to 4.2 is to 1 means, the ratio of the compressed image, uncompressed image divided by the compressed image, that is the ratio, compression ratio being talked about, 4.2 is to 1. Okay? The ratio of the uh, bits or bytes required to store the image in compressed format and uncompressed format. Okay? So, if the original image was something as seen here, as you can see even with a compression ratio of 4.2 is to 1, that means you almost require about one fourth the size to save this with respect to the original image, you will barely see any difference between this image and the original image. This is where what we are talking about, uh, uh, do not worry about the size of the enlargement or in the image, but it is only a matter of zooming here, but you will not be able to see the difference. There is some differences, but not. But let us look at a larger compression ratio. Now, if you look here, I have increased the compression ratio, 7.3 is to 1. That means, the image requires about 1 7 the size to store. Earlier it was 1 4th and it is 1 7. And if you look back into the picture, the left hand side image, which had a compression ratio of 4.2 4 is to 1, was almost close to the original image. But there are lots of facets here, if you carefully come and have a look, the background information, wherever there are regions of continuous information, either in the background or in the hat or on her face or on the shoulder or even here, there are patches of what is called as a blocking effect, blocking artifacts in JPEG. You can see it is clear here, you have, might have to probably change the brightness or contrast of the image to have a closer look. You can see certain patches here certain patch here, certain patches here as well, and there are the effect of course, similar to aliasing of a line, but it is on gray shades and this is called what is called the blocking artifacts. It is here present here also marginally, but not barely visible. This is highly close to the, it is so negligible that it is close to the original image, but is apparent here mostly as well as in some parts in this location. I think this part is very clear and of course, again in some parts in the bottom of the shoulder here and of course, on her face and on the hat as well, on the background portions here as well as here in this part, where there are significantly strong blocking artifacts of JPEG. This blocking comes mainly due to this 8 cross 8 blocks, which are talked about, but that is one of the reasons. The other reasons is some information is thrown out. As you can see, if I had not pointed you out these differences of the blocking artifacts, these two images would have been almost visually similar. If I show, if you look back to the original image and then I show you from this from a distance and even seen this, all the images look apparently similar. You will be able to identify that this is the image of the LENA. So, in terms of psycho visual redundancy is thrown, thrown out, the right hand side image requires one seventh or lesser space than the original image, hence it is better to save this image if you want to only show the image not to do some processing which requires original gray level pixel values, which is very rarely required. So, that is the purpose of image compression. 
Let us look a couple of last examples here. This is also a part of the LENA image and where the compression rate, there are various ways by which this compression uh, is uh, matrices which are used to define uh, compression. The previous one uh, which we used in the previous uh, was a compression ratio. Then we have the compression rate and the PSNR peak signal to noise ratio. Okay, these are signal processing terms. The how many bits are required per pixel? That means, in this case I require half bit per pixel with respect to one bit per pixel here. That means, this requires half the storage space of this and you can see some small artifacts coming out in the reconstructed image, not much visible. But this requires half the storage space, PSNR is about 31 dB. Look at this, I increase the compression 0.22 bits per pixel original image here, part of the mandrel image which is also very commonly used. These images are very popular because they have areas which have both textured and flat regions. So, that is why they are used. You can see the very strong blocking effect here all around almost. Everywhere you can see the blocking effect which is not available here, it is very smooth. Probably you have to come close to the uh, uh, screen to have a look at it. You can see these regions compare it with the blocking artifacts here. You can see effects of blocking here as well, which is very smooth here. Okay. Some blocking effects here as well, as well as here. Okay. All over the blocking artifacts is so because the compression ratio is so large 1 is to 36.22 bits per pixel, PSNR about 20 dB. So, that these are examples of JPEG image compression. In the time remaining, we will start the next section and then move on to the next lecture. Well, I have introduced the concept of the other part of digital image processing, which is also important from computer graphics people is to manipulate image so that you can improve the quality, which is called digital image enhancement. So, if you look into the slide, we will introduce the concept of digital image enhancement and stop where we are talking of what is called a contrast stretching. So, this is a pixel based operation where the image intensity or the gray level R lying within the range 0 to 1 is mapped into a gray level S 0 to L according to a transformation function. So, R is the input gray level, S is the output and you require a transformation function T. This process is mainly done or to use or it is used to enhance the images, uh, where you need to handle low contrast images occurring due to poor or non-uniform lighting conditions or due to non-linearity or small dynamic range of the imaging sensor. So, in many cases you require enhancement or contrast stretching, where the image could be degraded due to low lighting conditions, there could be noise in the image, we will talk of noise removal later on, but the image could be degraded due to uh, long storage, transmissions, it could be noisy, it could be the when it was acquired the sensor was not working well the lighting environment is very poor or there was maybe uh, some sort of camouflage or smoke where the picture quality did not. So, you need to probably do some stretching of the contrast, but we typically do these in TVs when you observe uh, any show entertainment or education whatever the purpose. So, uh, uh, we will see here in the next class examples of contrast stretching and enhancement based on pixel values, but just to uh, go back a basic example, any uh, enhancement based operation which does contrast stretching transforms a pixel value r of the original image to a pixel new pixel value s lying between range of gray level value 0 to l and this process is mainly done to handle low contrast images occurring due to poor or non uniform lighting conditions or due to non linearity or small dynamic range of the imaging sensor. So, these are the reasons why we need to enhance an image, improve the quality of the image and that is done by various techniques. We will discuss in the time remaining to us a few mechanisms of how to handle the image quality, how to improve the quality of the image if it is degraded due to lighting conditions, sensor conditions, sensor parameters or even due to degraded due to noise. We will discuss this aspect in the next class when we meet. Thank you very much.